You're listening to The Luxury Item, the podcast on the business of luxury and the people and companies that are shaping the future of the luxury industry. Here's your host, Scott Kerr. Sales of luxury watches worldwide are estimated at about $30 billion this year and are expected to grow as global wealth increases and Gen Z and millennials become more interested in high-end mechanical watches. These days, watch sales are following a similar pattern to the broader luxury market, where the most affluent consumers remain strongest. The ultra-wealthy are less affected by rising rates and economic uncertainty, so more and more brands are catering to the super spenders and VIP collectors who continue to spend on the highest quality and craftsmanship. With the high end being one of the main drivers of growth for luxury watchmakers, we're now seeing an all-out battle for the wrist. One of those players engaging in this battle is Bulgari Watches. The prestigious jewelry Maison was born in 1884 in Rome and has been making watches since the 1920s. Today, Bulgari Watches have become world-renowned for its immaculate quality and distinctive signature designs for both men and women. My guest on the luxury item is Antoine Pan, Managing Director of the Bulgari Watch Division. Antoine has more than 20 years of experience in the watch and jewelry industry, holding executive positions at Boucheron, Zenit, Tag Heuer, Berluti, and Bulgari. Antoine is one of the leading names not only in the world of watches, but also in the luxury industry. Welcome to the luxury item, Antoine. Well, hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to have you with me. You know, I know Watches and Wonders Watch Fair in Geneva kicks off the day this recording airs, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, this year marks an important milestone for Bulgari, the brand's 140th anniversary. And to kick off the celebration, you recently unveiled three limited edition variations of the Octo Finissimo sketch series. Each timepiece features illustrated dials that portray the movement as though you were observing the watch from the reverse side, akin to peering through an open case back. So incorporating the original watch design sketches into the actual finished watches is really an interesting idea. Bulgari's sketch series debuted in 2022. What is the artistic inspiration behind the sketch series? Interestingly, Scott, um, the, we always ask ourselves why we're doing things. And even though they seem extremely artistic, there is always some kind of, there are always reasons behind creations. Uh, and uh, this is a discussion we're often having with, uh, with Fabrizio Bonamassa, who is our creative director uh, uh, for the watch division of, of Bulgari. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, sketch is coming from an Italian word, which is skecchi. A skecchi is the drawing, the first projection of an idea. And, and historically, uh, sketch is starting to be collected, registered, and kept aside uh, a long time ago. But the first sketch is that we, we have real uh, evidence of and that we have also in our archives are coming from the 14th and 15th century in Italy mm -hmm. during the Renaissance time. Uh, the Quattrocento and Cinquecento is a moment when there are massive uh, innovation. Ma it's a moment of true transformation from a technical perspective first and then from an artistic perspective. And at that moment, uh, it is absolutely important for the for the artist and particularly for the Italian artist to put on paper the transcriptions of their ideas, but also the retranscriptions of their observation. This is true particularly for two matters, which is anatomia, anatomy of, of, of bodies, which were for the first time observed by artists, and also with this notion of, uh, uh, of uh, perspectives that clearly had to be projected on, on the drawings. And with these two notions, you see clear transformation in the artistic, uh, on the artistic scene, okay? Better depiction of the bodies through the observation of the anatomies, for instance. And in parallel with this, you see clearly the schools, artistic schools uh, related to the artists of the Renaissance time uh, that are developing and and obviously here as well, sketches are very useful for the master to explain and to transfer their knowledge and also their 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 projection, their ideas to their to their not their students because they were more than students, they were people executing right. the the masterpieces, and so you see that beside the 140 years of our own anniversary, there is this massive connection between our 
origins as an Italian brand and this notion of sketches. And this transferred into the way Fabrizio is working himself. He's always sketching. And that's why those sketches, they mean so much to us. And that's why actually Fabrizio is making so many sketches. And that's how it turned out to be something that is extremely meaningful to us. And obviously when you celebrate a birthday, you celebrate a, your own history, you're coming back to your roots. So I'm going to be very honest with you. We found out, this is while talking with Fabrizio, we realized that it's so much deep down into his, his brain, his DNA to do sketching, but it's also related to his own education as an Italian designer. Italian artists and designers work naturally with sketches, and this is a long, long tradition. Yeah, it's super interesting. And sketches are infinite, so he could sketch forever. And he, have... sketch, and he does. And he does. I tell you, he spends his, his days sketching. He's, he's thinking while he's uh, sketching. It's very interesting to see him uh, drawing while we're having uh, very deep discussions. A few months ago, LVMH held its fifth edition of LVMH Watch Week in Miami, presenting the latest timepieces from LVMH's Watches Maisons. Although LVMH Watch Week was only launched in 2020 in Dubai and was virtual for a couple of years amid the pandemic before returning live in Singapore last year, it has quickly gained traction as one of the most important events in the orological calendar. How was the concept for LVMH Watch Week founded and where did LVMH see the opportunity? It, it came out of uh, this, this three very special period of, of crisis, of affairs of 1919, and then confirmed in 20 with, obviously with the COVID, but also the, uh, the massive disruption that took place at the time with the Basel Fair. Basically, we were not satisfied with the way we would be meeting our stakeholders during uh, the Basel Fair too short a time, too crowded, too many interactions, not a proper time to sit down with the people who are building our success, be it the people from the press, but also, of course, our business partners. And we thought we needed a moment that would be a real moment where we could dedicate ourselves and dedicate our means as a group, but also for each and every brand, to our partners in a, in a more quiet moment uh, and, and where we would really have the time to, to, to work deeper together with our partners. We found out that we had many partners in common, so it was better to work together with Zenit, with Tag Heuer, with Hublot, and somewhat welcome all our partners in one location, an appropriate location, at the very beginning of the year. And, and it did gain traction because we all found it extremely positive for us, it was really the moment when we could properly touch base and prepare the year. For our partners, it was a time where they could also dedicate more um, precious time and, and proper time to, to us. And so we would always be extremely, uh, come out of those events, extremely happy from the output uh, and not necessarily just purely in, in terms of orders of articles, but also in terms of forward thinking, okay, uh, you, you need to spend time with your partners to think forward, to prop not just to address the, 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 the short-term operational matters, uh, introducing new products, et cetera, but more thinking collaboration over time, understanding the new, the, 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 the deep trends of the market. This comes out of longer discussions, probably discussions that are not just face to face, but over a drink at, at the end of the day, when you can really go deeper and, and talk longer. And, and so that's why we all feel that we've, we've strengthened the ties with our partners through those events. And that's why we are extremely satisfied with those events. And at the recent LVMH Watch Week, Bulgari unveiled three of its iconic classic watches that lean into the precious metal gold. The Bulgari, Bulgari, Octo Finissimo, and Lucia, all watches made bold statements with their take on gold. In fact, Bulgari's narrative around the show was time is gold. And gold has always been a hallmark element of Bulgari. And we're definitely seeing yellow gold watches gaining popularity again in the orological world. 
Why do you think yellow gold has been gaining popularity? Is it about the price of the metal itself, or is it something more emotional about gold that's connecting with today's luxury watch buyers? I think I think your point on on yeah the the, the emotional connection is certainly happening. Probably, like for any any item, there are there are trends, there are fashions. Even though I don't like to talk about fashions when we're talking about watches which are made for i mean uh, the beauty of our products is that they last for 100 years without a problem i mean you can always uh, use a mechanical watch from your 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 grandparents have it checked and and or and, it, and it's perfectly working so of course we need to go beyond we, we we really looking at timelessness this being said you can have some kind of fatigue from some materials from some colors and and there are trends and um, but what is interesting with with this yellow gold is uh, return. It's the fact that uh, somewhat we go back to the basics, and probably uh, we we we've been thinking about it, and and we connect this to this probably appetite for authenticity. So not twisting the materials, going back to the reality, the, the rough reality of natural products. Right. And yeah. somewhat going back to, well, the, the natural color of yellow rather than rose gold, which has been clearly dominating the market for the last decades. And, and, and so uh, a, a willingness to, to differ from the, from the previous trend, but also probably, yeah, if I'm buying gold, I'm buying a material that is naturally yellow. And so I'm, I'm, I'm keen to, to, to enjoy uh, the natural aspect of gold today. And, and I'm not, I'm not scared of, of wearing yellow, which is, of course, standing out probably more than, than as more subtle colors that, that is this light pink of, of, a gold, uh, of rose gold. But, uh, but definitely we see this trend coming out and, and we connect it to this notion of authenticity that is clearly a major social, uh, social element today. I want to dive into a couple of these releases and we'll start with the Bulgari, Bulgari timepiece, which is turning 50 next year. It famously features the name Bulgari, debossed around the 18 karat gold bezels and takes its inspiration from ancient Roman coins. It launched in the mid seventies, but it really gained popularity in the eighties and had a number of celebrity fans. What is it about this watch that has captivated individuals for the last five decades and why the relaunch now? Uh, you know, so, uh, last year we, uh, we, 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 we launched our very first book dedicated to the Bulgari watches only, mm -hmm. and it's uh, and it's it was a great moment for us to step back uh, and and get a real perspective on on our history. So we have more than 100 years of history of watches at Bulgari. So we are probably older than many many of the most famous watchmakers in the industry in terms of activity in watches. Clearly, our initial steps were in the world of jewelry watches. Um, but the oldest watch beside the jewelry watches that we launched was the uh, Bulgari Bulgari uh, collection. Uh, the name, it was actually called Bulgari Roma in relation to the coin. Now, if you look at this watch, it's quite interesting because if you ask a kid to draw a watch, he will draw a Bulgari, Bulgari watch. He will... The watch is perfect in, in, in its simplicity as it did from a design perspective. It's a, it's a wrong watch. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, and, and it's just got those, uh, uh, the, the, the two uh, lungs uh, on both sides to uh, all the, the bracelet. And it's, and it's absolutely perfect. It's like, you know, when you're talking about genius and you're talking about idea and you think, how come nobody thought about it before? And somewhat a product that comes like this. And but that's the beauty of design. Okay. And and so when Gianni Bulgari thought of this watch, he basically wanted to bring the the, the purest design and in the same time something that nobody had done before. And and connecting the perfect shape of a watch, of the standard watch, with this symbolic expression of the coin, of the Roman coin. So anchoring this perfect design into our Italian tradition again uh, was a genius idea. And in, in some way to build timeless designs. And 
while we let we the previous years when we prepared this book about our history this gave us the opportunity to look back at this collection at the bb and think how come we don't expose it and highlight the, the somewhat the perfection of its design its timelessness that's what we're looking at that's what we are aiming at at Bulgari, building a timeless product in a way and we have it it's in front of us but we've just it's somewhat again what what is obvious disappears in the landscape and so it gives us this 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 work on our book gave us the opportunity to look at Bulgari Bulgari with a, a fresh eye and to think oh my god we have such an amazing product it's perfect it's it's perfect and I'll I'll get back to this and and we don't expose it that much so we we went back took it back it brought it the preciousness it, it had the preciousness it had at the beginning by exposing it in gold again and uh, and and that's how it came back this year now when i'm talking about perfection i know we i mean uh, i'm not an expert in design but what uh, designers will tell you is never go for something that is unnecessary right and and where i see where i'm thinking of the perfection of the design i love the fact that there is no logo on the dials of our watches why because there is a logo on the bezel and if it's embossed on the bezel why would you repeat it so it's a watch that is a wrong watch it's got it's it's so standard so basic but actually if you remove the 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 name on the bezel of this one, oh, sorry, on, on the dial of this watch, which is already done, by the way, you still recognize it as a Bulgari watch by essence. And how can you do, how can you turn a product that is so, so simple in its shape into something that is just, that nobody can copy? That's that's the genius of the those designers at the time, 50 years ago, and, and we love it. I mean, back to simplicity, back to, basics but in the same time doing something that nobody can copy yeah it's the perfect and, example of less is more yes absolutely and in that sense when, when less is more any element remaining has its very important you also unveil two new versions of the iconic octo finissimo model which has been around since 2014 and has set eight world records if i count correctly for thinness <laughs> over the course of a decade and the last one being the Octo Finissimo Ultra in 2022, measuring a mere 1.8 millimeters thick or thin, however you want to look at it. And in recent years, the other heavyweights in the watchmaking industry have battled it out to hold the record for world's thinnest watch. Why did Bulgari set out to take skinny watchmaking to extremes in the first place? Okay, it's, you know, great ideas. Usually they get back to simple 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 things simple concepts at the beginning um we were at that moment when we thought what i mean what the key question that we ask ourselves constantly is why are we standing here in switzerland when we're an italian brand what makes us different what what do we bring to the swiss watch industry as an italian brand and and obviously it's our italianity mm -hmm. it's two things, our origins as a jeweler and our Italianity. And, and when you think of this, when you think of the way people wear watches, like they would wear accessories, like they would wear a suit in Italy, something that comes out like, uh, like a, as a legendary element of uh, Italian style is the elegance, is actually the Italian style. This kind of casual chic way of wearing things that 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 has made a legend of italian people okay you're you're thinking of italianity you're thinking of a a, be, a, a beautiful woman a, a very well dressed man in a casual no no ties obviously casual suit and then probably uh, uh, and i'm going to use a, a different brands not on the group but Todd's shoes and mm -hmm. and on by the beach and they go to a very chic restaurant but there is a kind of relaxed way of wearing beautiful items. And I think that's what style is about, okay, or elegance. It's about wearing sophistication in a very natural way. And, and how does this transfer when you're thinking of Italy? Well, if you think of tailoring in Italy, in Italy, 
all the suits are very light, very supple, because the weather is hot. So when you're wearing suits, you're wearing things that are very like a second skin, very thin, very light, and um, and therefore you're feeling comfortable with these suits, and and that's how you bring style. You 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 don't you don't force the the wearing in a way, and and this has driven um, Fabrizio and the team at the time to rethink their design. The first Octo that was launched, what's called which was called Octo Original, was quite quite big, uh, quite really. I mean, was actually following the trends of the market. Big, sturdy, heavy watches. And there was a moment when, I mean, I mean, I was there, but I was in a different position. I was in the market and we, we sort of stood back and said, are we really successful when we try to be like the other ones? Or is it really what we should do? Or should we actually stand out and have our own perspective on things? And, and that's how things started. Let's do something that is actually super thin that fits the wrist the way a suit would fit a body that is very light to wear very comfortable and 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 beautiful in its way and let's force the technique let's capitalize on new technical achievement to build those extremely thin movements that allow for the design to express our italianity and that's how how things started and 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 of course you realize that yes it does match a strategic perspective, then, then we know why we are here for, what we are here for. We're here for this ex unique expression of, tech, of, of joint design and technology, of, of association of both elements. We are the proud ambassador of Leonardo da Vinci, the man who is able to, to paint uh, Mona Lisa, but also to draw the first sketch of a submarine. Oh, by the way, a sketch hmm. or a parachute. An, an extraordinary genius in terms of engineering, but also an extraordinary artist. And probably that's what we stand for, expressing those two things, the this exceptional ap appetite for innovation and technical innovation, supporting the creativity and the design. Somewhat, the Octo Finissimo was, was almost an act of birth of Bulgari as a watch manufacturer, not as a watch brand, but as a watch manufacturer, because everything was internalized at the time. And, and that's how we started. And, and, and of course, then you start to play with the concept. What we did, we do the tourbillon, then we do the automatic watch, then we do the minute repeater, then we do the chronograph, then we do the, the tourbillon chronograph, and we ended up building this culture of performance that has always been in the DNA of, of watchmaking. I mean, we should remember that the, all the names in the industry are related to people who have invented, who have been extraordinary engineers or watchmakers, and who clearly de uh, developed patented products, invented new techniques in order to deliver better products, more precise products. Abraham Louis Breguet, who created the tourbillon, wanted to make the most uh, precise watch on the market. So, in a way, we follow the long tradition of high horology, but in our way, which is the Italian way, and we built our position, our, our place today, through this quest for a very, very thin product, which is the way Italian people, we believe, would wear uh, Grand complications. And Bulgari showcased new timepieces from the Lucia collection, which is also celebrating its 10th anniversary and is Bulgari's flagship women's watch collection. And up to that point in 2014, when the Lucia line was unveiled, Bulgari never launched an everyday watch for women. What was the design approach that Bulgari took when it created the Lucia? And what type of woman did it have in mind? Um... I think uh, Lucia is an interesting product, somewhat like Octoroma today. It's it's the the, the willingness that we show um, to to reach out to a, a wider crowd, not just to cling to an to an elite of people, but trying to to open the door to the Bulgari world to probably people 
a clientele that would be a bit more classic. We, I must recall that our designs are very strong. They're, they, they stand out. I mean, again, uh, we were talking about uh, Bulgari Bulgari. The, the, the name stands out on the bezel of the watch. It's not right. discreet in a sense. If you think of our bestseller, which is the Serpenti uh, collection, yeah. it's and the particularly the Serpenti Tobogas, it's a 212 bracelet that is enveloping your the wrist of the customers. It's it's clearly a very strong design, and we and and you you shouldn't be really shy of exposing your 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 watch and yourselves when you wear those watches. So we thought, nice, great, but first of all, when we do such products, they are usually quite expensive, and they are very special. So do we do we stick to a very limited crowd of of people, or do we want to expand and 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 show our, our um, appetite or for watches or our passion for watches or also our technical expertise to a wider crowd. At the same time as we were developing the B01 jewelry collection, the Diva collection, we thought it was great to also propose a watch that would be probably uh, more accessible from a design perspective and probably more affordable as well. And we're seeing luxury watchmakers are exploring urgent solutions to remain relevant. And that exploration has included a focus on female consumers who are buying more watches and larger case sizes for themselves, as well as a move towards gender neutral design. Women have been rising the ranks of some of the biggest watch brands. How is Bulgari looking to expand its appeal among women? Today, we have a wider clientele of women than, than men uh, from our own record in our boutiques. So I think we, we do have this connection. Um, what we love to do, we love to mix our two areas of expertise. And that is to say watchmaking and jewelry. We love to think that we can develop a movement in our own manufacture uh, made for uh, late, uh, very ladies-oriented designs. Uh, and, and that's clearly what we are developing these days. So we are making high jewelry watches, but we are removing the quartz caliber inside. We, are, we have developed recently a caliber which is called Piccolissimo, which is the smallest round caliber on the market. It's uh, basically a slightly, uh, it's a slightly above one gram, more than 100 components mechanical movement. So it's high urology put into high jewelry watches in the sense that we, we would we love to bring the best of both worlds. And that's a way to say, no, there is no uh, dedicated sector. Uh, watches is not just more, the watches, uh, uh, let's say, appreciation for mechanical caliber is not just something that that is belonging to the, the ma masculine uh, population. We should remember that until, I would say until the, the 80s, um, a, a lot of the watchmaking performance was related to, to watches that were considered as professional tools. Uh, I still remember starting my career at Tag Heuer, where, where, and the, the slogan of Tag at the time was professional sports watches. Right. So there was really a notion of functionality and the destination was very masculine. And that was particularly true with mechanical movement. Uh, we love to think that there are people in, in the world on, in all categories of population who love watchmaking for the sake of watchmaking, who see uh, the, uh, the, the, the techniques on uh, metier d'art, on mestieri d'arte, on craft, both from a pure decoration point of view, but also from a, a mechanical engine perspective. And this should not be related only to uh, the main uh, population. And so that's why we are developing today calibers that are more dedicated to very small watches, which naturally fit more on the wrist of ladies. Bulgari has grown into one of the most internationally recognized and diversified luxury brands. There was a time when people viewed Bulgari as a fine jeweler doing a bit of watchmaking on the side, but Bulgari has been making remarkable headway in neurology in recent years, and its watches are making the grail lists of industry pros and casual enthusiasts alike. When was that turning point for the watch brand that accelerated its popularity and position in the marketplace? Well, there is, uh, I see two turning points. The first point is the late 90s. In the late 90s, Bulgari has a huge experience, a huge success uh, with watches. 
it's a uh, sports watch it's casual i mean it's actually uh very uh casual chic kind of watches so it's the collections that are called uh, uh bulgari bulgari aluminium it's the diagonal uh, collection and, and it's extremely successful so successful that at the time bulgari decides to uh to to go for acquisitions of suppliers of of components of watch components of cases bracelets dials and beside this bulgari decides to purchase some brands as well some some very uh, boutique brands uh, which were called uh, gerard genta and daniel Rolf. And, and somewhat building a little group in the watch making industry um and and this is at the very uh, at the turn of uh, the, the 20th century so between 1998 and, and 2000 and as much as this helps to build the uh, a very solid uh, industrial infrastructure for the for the brand it somewhat starts building confusion it's very difficult to run a brand and and to run a group of different brands and and uh, you want to build synergies but you want to respect the different identities of the maisons and and it's clearly something that is very very subtle so the this pivot this is this is clearly so there there is this moment of this acquisition so the bulgari uh, is at the head of of this extremely important manufacturing tool so what is bulgari going to do with it and it's taking a few years to understand how bulgari can make the most of the of all this acquisition probably let's say a decade and and then until the second moment. So first moment, acquisition, a constitution of a manufacturing, of a real manufacturer. Second turning point, as I mentioned before, and is the launch of Octofinissimo. Octofinissimo is the very first watch that is integrating the Italian design with a caliber that is in-house developed and, and everything is, is fitting together. So it's the first, in a, in a way, it's the first manufacturer watch developed produced by Bulgari and in that sense it's the way we've built the success over the last the last uh, 25 years first constituting uh, a true manufacturer from being just a brand making watches uh, and, and buying components to having a full industrial base then integrating this base swallowing it in order to be able to develop to to conceive develop and produce our own manufacturer watches and from then building our identity of a, as a real swiss manufacturer of italian origins and i hope i'm being clear I, yeah i just want to pivot for a minute to talk about the luxury watch market it's been facing some headwinds these days buyers of luxury watches have been reigning in spending amid economic and geopolitical concerns but despite the downward trend over the last year, LVMH's Julian Watch Division, which includes Bulgari, you know, had a pretty strong 2023. What is your take on the luxury watch market and how is it impacting Bulgari's business? Actually, if you um, if you look, there is a very interesting indicator, and it's the Swiss exports. It's basically the uh, watch business indicator, uh, the premium watch business uh, health indicator on the market. Uh, it's uh, so we receive on a monthly basis the results of the exports uh, from Switzerland to the rest of the world, and and um, and if you look at it with a very long perspective, thirty years, you you can you can identify periods that are you can identify two two trends basically. One one global trend is the global uh, positive evolution of the exports in value so it's it's extremely regular in reality over the last 30 years uh, the, the the progression is is almost systematic and it's very linear and in reality when you put this in perspective with the number of units of watches sold you see that it's actually a linear progression towards uh the high end so we are selling less watches more and more expensive mm -hmm. more and more precious more than expensive, um, but it's very, very regular. Then the other pattern is a pattern of prices, of moments, of adjustments. And so what happens? You've got exports are, are slowing down. So you see a, a couple of years 
where the business is going down. So it's clearly related to economic crisis, 2000 or, or economic or health crisis. So 2003, um, there is uh, the, uh, the SARS in, uh, in, in Asia drop in, uh, in, the, uh, in the business. 2008, economical crisis, a financial crisis in the, in the Western world globally, drop in the exports. 2020, COVID, drop in the exports. Systematically after those drops, there is a fast acceleration. Okay, so a rebound, systematically. And that's also a couple of years. So you basically have one or two years of drop, most, mostly one year of drop, and then two year of sharp rebound. Hmm. And then a few years of stabilization. So basically as if the, the market was normalizing after uh, a period of trouble, of, uh, of uh, let's say uh, a period of instab instability. Yeah. Okay, so the pattern is quite systematic. So right now, we are in the phase of we've had the drop of the COVID, significant drop, the significant rebound of the post-COVID consumption, and now we are normalizing. The takeout for us at IVMH is, is I, I think we, we can, we, we're lucky enough that we have this culture of luxury which, and this culture of patrimony. We are, even though we are a public group, we're also family owned, and with family-owned companies, there is always a long-term perspective. Building the equity, uh, protecting the equity, thinking long-term. And as much as we clearly have a very competitive stance at, at business, we also look beyond the trends and the moments. And, and, and this is how we look at it. Okay, fair enough, there is ups and downs, but we're ready for that. And we know how to adapt. And we are basically, when times are great, we don't feel we don't fall in the in, in some kind of euphoria. When times are down, we are we are not in depression. We we know that there is a moment after. We just need to go through those periods, optimizing our manufacturing tool, optimizing our our capacities for the best and the worst. But we are here for long for the long term, not for the short term. And when you think about your clientele, Bulgaria's demographic tends to be the upper echelons of global wealth who aren't subject to the upswings and downswings of consumer spending trends. Is this the rarefied audience driving your business right now? It is. I mean, obviously, this this clientele is uh, is uh, is always. I mean, let, let's be clear. They're also uh, clearly looking at the business, but they don't look at it necessarily in the same way. Right. Uh, they're they're purchasing from from their assets, not from their revenues. In the sense that uh, today, somebody with uh, with significant financial assets will look at the stock exchange and will be in a more rosy mood than somebody who is probably is concerned with uh, the uh, pensions or the fact that inflation is uh, is uh, going at a faster pace than his salaries for instance so clearly uh you you have a you have a discrepancy in terms of phasing normally very rich people will be more cautious at the beginning of the crisis when the stock exchange is going down when they 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 see the early signs of the crisis when actually people who are more in the middle class will uh, will be affected in the second phase I want to talk about your retail strategy. Bulgari Watches has a large wholesale business to multi-brand retailers worldwide and a number of mono-brand boutiques too. The customer experience for luxury brands remains physical and for watches perhaps even more so. We're seeing many luxury players out there investing and expanding their network of mono-brand boutiques with the goal of owning the brand experience. As part of your long-term strategy, do you see putting greater focus on growing your footprint of Bulgari Watch boutiques? Not necessarily. Uh, so first, you have a very, very good point, Scott. The physical experience is more important than ever. Uh, and, and this is where you build your education when you're not uh, a, a very frequent uh, purchaser of, of watches. And obviously, the, the, the clientele in general who buys precious watches, they will buy a few, but they won't buy 
uh, a, a watch uh, very very frequently so when they're buying they they need to to be exposed to the product and and because it's those items are expensive there is an uh, a desire to experience physically the product to wear it to see how how do i look with it is it, is it heavy how how does it perform and in the, in that perspective for people who are not absolute fans again i'm talking about the average clientele there is always a moment of education and this goes this happens in one place it happens at retailers because retailers multi-brand retailers is the only place where you can wear and compare and build your own culture your own education from comparison mm -hmm. okay i think it's einstein who said there is no no education but from experience the rest is information and i think this is very much what we're talking about customers are educating them themselves because they can compare and there is no better place to compare physically than multi-brand retailers and that's where we love to expose ourselves because at retailers we put ourselves in the field in the on the battlefield we don't we are not protected by the walls of our own boutiques this is where first business partners can challenge us and say guys you're good but not as good as x or z and uh, and they're better they're doing better than you on this and this perspective so this is how we expose ourselves to competition and we can uh, how we can improve in our own development and it's also when we've managed to convince our business partners they are the best ambassadors and they are the ones who put ourselves against key competitors and that's why i believe that business partners they are absolutely key for us bulgari to progressively expose ourselves and be, be put in competition with the key players of the of the industry now i also believe again starting uh, going back to my initial point that today people who want to build their education and to who, are, who have an interest in watches there is basically no better place than a, a multi-brand retailers for them to to experience things. Of course, they can go to museums. Of course, they can go on the web. They'll 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 listen to they'll look at videos. They'll listen to interviews. They 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 read. But the physical contact. We're talking about luxury item. We're talking about a sensual experience. Uh, you're listening to the sound of a chiming watch. You're you're feeling the weight of the watch on your wrists. You're you're feeling the 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 the, the, the beauty of the sparkle of the stones of a, of a jewelry watch. And that's a personal, physical bonding with the product that you need to experience. And, uh, and for that, I totally, to, I'm absolutely convinced that multi-brand retailers have a real role to play. In a recent interview, Bulgari CEO Jean-Christophe Baba said, Bulgari is primarily a magnificent Roman jeweler and that everything else we would do would be connected to being Roman and being a jeweler. This means that we are the Roman jeweler of time, the Roman jeweler of precious skins, of olfactive emotions for fragrances, etc. As the Roman jeweler of time, what is the emotional territory that Bulgari wants to own with its watch customers? When we are when we are developing a new product, this is the very first question we are asking ourselves. How do we express our, our Roman identity in this product? This is done by uh, deep diving into our own brain uh, and our own uh, emotions or feelings when uh, when considering on conceiving an idea or a product. So it's a, it's a lot of uh, introspection, uh, again with uh, Fabrizio, but also with the studio globally and with the marketing team to understand why we came with this idea. I mean, they, they, they are brainstorms uh, and it's very strange that we are debriefing the brainstorms so uh, lots of uh, lots of interactions in terms of creativity around the product around the caliber a new idea of caliber where do we want to go why do we want to go there and 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 let's say a lot of uh, yes of, of exchange of, uh, of intellectual and emotional exchange and then the uh, meeting stops and probably a few days after we sit down again and say, how come did we get to this idea? Why did we think of this shape? 
of a of a of a papyrus leaf of a ginkgo leaf that is actually that has given birth to the diva collection which is a collection that you can see both in our jewelry but also in our watches well papyrus is what you see in uh, in the egyptian world this diva shape is actually the shape you will see on the mosaics of the terms of caracalla in rome mm -hmm. um, and and if you go through the design of all our products you will see connection and with the uh, the world of uh, of the city of the old city of roma everywhere so of course one day with one product you could think that things happen by, happen by chance i would i would challenge you i would argue that any design you can pick from the bulgari collections is in a way or another related to uh, Roman architecture or uh, or uh, artistic expressions and clearly identifiable ones. April 9th kicks off the annual Watches and Wonders Fair in Geneva. It's the biggest event of the year in the industry. Brands from around the world showcase new wares. Can you share what new timepieces can we expect from Bulgari at the show? Um, there'll be a new world we call. Uh, and I can even anticipate to you that actually we will not be the only brand to come with a world record of thinness this year. Mm -hmm. um, I must say that I'm a bit uh, embarrassed to address this because when we launched the Octo Finissimo Ultra two years ago, so 1.8 millimeter of thickness, uh, for the auditors, it's actually thinner than, uh, than uh, the average uh, uh, coin that they would mm -hmm. use uh, in their daily lives. So it's, a, it's extremely, extremely thin. Uh, so we are actually presenting uh, the uh, thinnest watch in the market. Uh, it's uh, the new Octo Finissimo Ultra is 1.7 millimeter wow. uh, thick. This we would not have presented it just for that point. And actually, the challenge that we we achieved this year is uh, somewhere else. Uh, in reality, this is the thinnest watch on the market, but more importantly, it's the thinnest chronometer on the market. Hmm. So what is a chronometer? A chronometer is not a chronograph. Sometimes people are confused with those two uh, notions. Right. A chronometer is a very precise watch. It's a, pre it's a watch that is certified by an official organization called the COSC, C-O-S-C. And basically, the, the, this organization is testing the watches, the calibers uh, of the industries, or so Rolex, Omega, etc., all the, the the leaders of uh, particularly of, of sports watches, and making sure the watch is remaining very precise over the over the course of time in different positions. So whatever the way you wear the watch, it will not lose or gain a lot of time. It will be precise by a couple of seconds, plus or minus a day, which is considered as a very precise watch. So all. Octo Finissimo Ultra Mark II, the ones with the watch that we are presenting uh, on the on the ninth, is actually 1.7 millimeter, but is reaching this level of precision and of uh, orological performance as well. So as Bulgari Watches continues to cultivate its territory and express more and more of its identity, what are your ambitions for the brand? It's uh, uh, very complicated. We're very ambitious for the brand. We believe we have a lot to say. Yeah. We, we believe nobody listens to us. We want to shout out even more. <laughs> but seriously, um, I think there's something that really motivates us is to enchant the world. It's really to hear wow, to hear you, you say wow when I answered the previous question. That's what excites us. That's what we believe we're here for. Uh, frankly, giving time, we, we are not as precise as any watch, uh, any iPhone, right? So you don't buy our watches because you want something that is so precise as an iPhone. You want something else. You want to step into a Bulgari store because you want us to, to create enthusiasm, passion, emotion, the sparkle in your eyes. And that, that is our ambition. We want people to think that, to be surprised by what we show. But also, and that's the trick, uh, I, I think... We love to hear we, we love to hear those two sentences. First, we love to hear, wow, I did not expect this. And then after a silence, but it is so bulgary. So it's not just about creating a shock. 
It's about creating a shock that is totally relevant to who we are. I love the sentence uh, our head of uh, communication developed last year, and it's called, and he it said uh, the, she said the motto of the, the of our last advertising campaign was unexpected wonders, and I love to think that that's what we want and what that what that's what we love to do, propose unexpected wonders. So Antoine, my final question is the luxury item question, which I ask all my guests. So if you were stranded on a deserted island and you could only have one single luxury item with you, what would that luxury item be? It can't be any form of air or water transportation to get you off that island or anything that requires mobile service so you can call somebody to get you off that island. It's just <laughs> lonely you on this island with lots of sand, palm trees, lots of ocean. What single luxury item would you like to have with you? Um, I would take a book with me. I would take a book and that would be a way for me to to leave the island even if I didn't get the air water transportation. And I've been thinking of which book I would I would look at and I would consider. And I'm thinking it depends on whether you give me really one item or if I can take a collection of books. But mm -hmm. if, if 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 it's one book, I would probably uh, so I'm I'm of French origin. So yeah. I would take a French author and I would probably take a book by Jules Verne. Hmm. Jules Verne hmm. is this uh, interesting French, yeah. French author who of wrote a lot of books actually about desert islands, by the way, like uh, Deux ans de vacances, two years yeah. of holiday or the uh, mysterious island. Of course, he, he built the story of Nemo and uh, and and so all those uh, all those stories. So I would take him. And if you allow me to take a full collection of books, I would take another collection, which is uh, by Emile Zola, which is uh, La Fortune des Rougons. First, the Rougon Macar, first because it's probably uh, 30 or 40,000 pages of, of history, so it, it gives me the time to, uh, I can occupy my time on the island, and also because it's a, it's a beautiful author. Antoine Pain, Managing Director of the Bulgari Watch Division, thank you so much for joining me on The Luxury Item. You're very welcome, and thank you for the, your very, very insightful questions. That's it for this episode of the Luxury Item Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this useful and entertaining, I would be really grateful if you can share it with a friend or colleague. I would love it if you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. The Luxury Item Podcast is a production of Silvertone Consulting. I'm your host, Scott Kerr. Until next time.